Our next speaker uh, this afternoon is uh, Dr. Umit Oskin. Dr. Oskin got her PhD from Iowa State University, and from that point she went to the chemical engineering department at Ohio State University. Her research interests are in the area of heterogeneous catalysis and reaction kinetics. Um, currently she's focusing on partial oxidation, environmental pollution control, and utilization of alternative energy sources in an environmentally friendly manner. Uh, she's received several awards and honors of those. Um, she's received the Ohio Standing Woman, Women, Women in Science Award in 1996, the Keck Foundation Excellence in Engineering Education Award, and the Outstanding Engineering Educator of Ohio in 1990. Oh, excuse me. Her co-authors <laughs> are Lee Sing Zang and Paul Clark, and the title of her talk will be Performance and post-reactor characterization of gamma lithonitride catalysts and simultaneous hydro desulfurization and hydro denitrogenation reactions. Thank you, Steve. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon is uh, some of the recent work that we have been doing on simultaneous hydro desulfurization, hydro denitrogenation reactions, but this time we are looking at a different class of catalysts, uh, namely molybdenum nitride reactions. My co-authors here are Dr. Li Ping Zhang, who recently finished her PhD in my group and joined Union Carbide, and um, Paul Clark, who finished his master's degree in my group. The objectives of this work um, have been to examine the hydrogen nitrogenation performance of molybdenum nitride catalysts in a sulfur containing reaction media. This is really the key, not only looking at the hydrogen nitrogenation activity, but looking at it when there are sulfur compounds present in the system. To determine the changes that takes place over the catalyst surface during simultaneous HDS-HDN reactions through post-reaction characterization, and also to provide a comparison using our other phase of the study, a comparison between the performance of sulfide and nitride catalysts after they have been used in um, sulfur-containing reaction media. Um, catalysts in this study, the nitride catalysts, have been prepared using a uh, temperature programmed reductive nitriding process of ultra-high purity molybdenum trioxide in a flow of pure ammonia. This is a, a fairly involved process which includes several uh, ramping cooling stages, followed by a passivation step with oxygen at room temperature. This is uh, usually done over a period of 24 hours. And then in situ activation with hydrogen at 400 degrees centigrade for about 12 hours. The catalyst characterization techniques that we have used include BET surface area measurements, X-ray diffraction, TPD and TPR uh, experiments, scanning electron microscopy, and especially for the post-reaction characterization, controlled atmosphere X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. If we take an initial look at the TPD profiles of the molybdenum nitride catalyst, um, what we are seeing here is an early nitrogen desorption feature, which is taking place uh, starting as early as 150-200 degrees centigrade, um, followed by a, a much larger nitrogen desorption. Uh, we are assuming or suspecting that the early uh, shoulder that we see is the desorption of nitrogen from surface, subsurface. However, once we reach to this temperature around 750 degrees centigrade, probably nitrogen is beginning to evolve from the lattice of the nitride structure. We also see, although in much uh, smaller intensity, we also see some ammonia and water desorption in this experiment. Now, through these experiments, we determined that to get rid of all of the adsorbed ammonia and water species, we had to degas the sample uh, at least at a temperature of 500 degrees centigrade. And that was a basis for our pretreatment procedure in our TPR experiments, where the catalyst was first 
heat gas at 500 degrees centigrade to eliminate all of the adsorbed ammonia and water species. This way we were able to differentiate ammonia and water forming as a result of the reduction reaction versus uh, those that have been adsorbed and desorbing on the surface. Now, again, uh, we see very strong hydro, uh, water signal. The first major peak uh, takes place around 350 degrees or 330 degrees centigrade. There's an earlier shoulder. Um, and a second uh, water signal, which takes place, which has a maximum around 760 degrees centigrade. Now, I will go back and compare some of these results with the X-ray diffraction characterization that we have done. What we have done in that uh, in the X-ray diffraction was um, abort the TPR experiment at this point, and then abort it again at this point, and without exposing the samples to um, air, do an X-ray diffraction experiment on them. Now, before I go into that, let me also uh, mention the nitrogen and ammonia signals. Again, I'd like to point out that these are much, especially ammonia is a much weaker signal. We start um, a maximum around 450 or 500 degrees centigrade. Uh, but the maximum for ammonia coincides with the onset of the nitrogen signal here. And we're suspecting that the early nitrogen evolve, evolution that we see from the surface possibly uh, may be due to decomposition of ammonia, which uh, in independent experiments we have shown that ammonia can decompose at these temperatures over some of these similar catalytic materials. Now, what is um, more interesting here is a high temperature and a very sharp nitrogen signal, and this corresponds to really uh, the uh, decomposition or, or destruction of the nitrite structure altogether. So if I go back and um, look at the X-ray diffraction spectra that I mentioned, the top uh, pattern corresponds to a sample which has been passivated, uh, and then we are looking at a sample which has been activated. As you can see, both samples have a small amount of molybdenum um, dioxide in them. Now, this sample has, uh, has been exposed to TPR conditions up to 795 degrees centigrade. And as you can see at this point, we have uh, eliminated the oxide phase completely. So this indicates that the first water uh, signal that we saw really corresponds to the surface oxide, which is formed during the passivation step. But the second water signal that we see is a result of the reduction of the oxide uh, signal, what oxide um, phase, which is left behind from the preparation step. After we expose the sample to TPR conditions at 950 degrees centigrade, however, the nitrite structure is completely destroyed, and we are left with a pure metallic structure. Actually, we have done some uh, SCM studies on the sample, and we are ending up with a very porous, almost sponge-like, high surface area metallic molybdenum, which may, may have some interesting um, properties itself, but that's another topic probably. Now, let me move on to reaction experiments. Um, there are basically three groups of experiments that I will talk about, hydrodesulfurization of benzothiophene, in the absence and in the presence of feed ammonia, hydrogenitrogenation or indole in the absence and presence of feed H2S, and then a third group of experiments where we have looked at simultaneous HDN of indole and HDS of benzothiophene. Reaction parameters uh, quickly, a vapor phase flow reactors, temperature range 200 to 380 degrees centigrade, pressure 100 psi. <coughs> Again, catalyst loading is different for the nitride and the sulfide um, catalyst, but we were trying to achieve equal conversion levels. Now, let me start out by talking about the benzothiophene HDS results. 
based on what we have observed during these experiments, um, we have come up with a suggested network for benzotiophene hydrodesulfurization, which is uh, relatively simple. The major product that we observe from benzotiophene HTS is ethylbenzene. At uh, some conditions, there's a um, dihydrobenzothiophene as an intermediate present, and this leads, leads us to suggest that um, before the sulfur hydrogenolysis takes place, the <coughs> atom ring has to be saturated. Also, the fact that among the hydrocarbons that we obtain, almost 99% is the unsaturated hydrocarbon, in this case ethylbenzene, uh, suggests that we don't have to have the benzene ring saturation before the uh, desulfurization takes place. Now, if we look at benzothiophene HDS studies at different reaction media, uh, here we are looking at conversion rates and ethylbenzene and dihydrobenzothiophene formation rates. Obviously, these are the observed formation rates as a function of temperature. We're starting with only benzothiophene in the feed system. What we see here is at um, temperatures equal or above 260 degrees centigrade, we are getting essentially complete conversion. This is where the feed flux is uh, approximately. And also ethylbenzene formation rate is equal to um, the co conversion rate, meaning we are getting complete desulfurization. At 200 degrees centigrade, we don't have complete conversion. Also, we don't have um, complete desulfurization. We are seeing significant levels of dihydrobenzothiophene. Now, when we have sulfur comp uh, when we have ammonia present in the system, together fed together with the benzothiophene, if we look at 260 degrees centigrade, we see some inhibition effect. We don't see it at the higher temperatures, but 260 degrees C, conversion is less than uh, complete. Also, um, there's significant levels of dihydrobenzothiophene. However, the major um, inhibition effect is seen when we feed benzothiophene and indole together. Actually, at every temperature, even at the highest temperature we have used, there's significant um, inhibition effect and also some levels of dihydrobenzothiophene. Obviously, uh, we couldn't separate, in this case, ethylbenzene, which is being formed in this reaction versus in the indole reaction. That's why it's not reported. Now, if we move on to indole HDN reaction network, again, based on our observations, as well as some of the reports from the literature, the working mechanism that we are uh, proposing uh, consists of an initial step, which is usually thermodynamically controlled. It is a readily reversible um, hydrogenation of the heteroatom, uh, resulting in indoline formation, followed by the first hydrogenolysis step, giving us uh, uh, orthoethyl aniline. And then after the aniline formation, there is different dealkylation steps because we are seeing different um, anilines uh, in the product stream. And we are suspecting that after the aniline formation, the denitrogenation, again, is going through multiple steps. There is either a complete hydrogenation or possibly a partial hydrogenation, as is seen here, followed by a beta uh, substitution, giving us this uh, nitrogen-free compound, either uh, unsaturated or completely saturated. Now, again, if we consider um, indole conversion and denitrogenation rate over this catalyst in different reaction media, a few important observations can be made. First of all, at um, lower temperatures, 200 260 degrees centigrade, the HDN rate is essentially zero, so we don't really get much nitrogen removal. Now, uh, as we reach 380 degrees centigrade, we get um, essentially complete conversion. At the same time, the nit denitrogenation rate becomes equal to conversion rate, meaning any indole which is converted has gone through the complete um, uh, steps and has reached the nitrogen-free form. 
Another interesting feature to note is that when we have sulfur compounds present in the system, especially at this, if we look at this high temperature, we see a significant inhibition effect. As you can see, both the conversion rate and the HDN rate is lower. HDN rate seems to be more affected, and if we compare H2S, H2S versus benzothiophene, we see a much more as a much more severe inhibition effect when we have benzothiophene present. Now, obviously, the uh, saturation ratio of these hydrocarbons is important because we don't want to use up a lot of hydrogen unnecessarily saturating the hydrocarbons in the process of denitrogenation. So here we are comparing total hydrocarbons, C6, C7, C8 combined, and unsaturated hydrocarbons. You can look at them as the more desirable products. Again, if we look at only indole case first, at two different temperatures, what we see is that unsaturated hydrocarbons pretty much make up almost all of the total hydrocarbons, meaning we don't have a whole lot of hydrogenation at this point. Now, if, you, if we introduce a sulfur compound to the system, well, uh, first of all, it, with the benzothiophene, there is an overall inhibition effect. But maybe more importantly, if you compare the blue bars with the pink bars, we will see that the aromatics, the unsaturated hydrocarbons, this time really make up only a small fraction of the total hydrocarbons, meaning majority of the hydrocarbons that we are producing are completely hydrogenating in the presence of sulfur compounds. Now, if we compare um, the three C8 hydrocarbons, which are the main um, uh, hydrocarbon product that we observe, um, uh, namely ethyl cyclohexane, ethyl benzene, and ethyl cyclohexene, what we see here is when we have only indole, ethyl benzene is the major product. When we have sulfur compounds present, some of the completely hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated react uh, products become important, namely ethyl cyclohexane in this case, and both ethyl cyclohexane and ethyl cyclohexane actually in both cases. Now, one last um, product distribution observation is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have seen significant levels of aniline formation. The largest amount is orthoethyl aniline. However, um, we see that before the nitrogen is removed, there is some dealkylation because we also see non-negligible levels of um, orthomethyl aniline and in some cases, small amounts of aniline as well. Now, as I said at the beginning, uh, we wanted to compare the behavior of the nitride catalyst with the, with the sulfide catalyst because, in general, um, they're kind of quoted in the literature saying that uh, nitride catalysts can be much more successful in HDN reactions because of their low hydrogen consumption because they don't end up saturating all the hydrocarbons. Now, we wanted to make some comparison, and really the best comparison we thought would be with the molybdenum nitride with the sulfided um, molybdenum catalyst. This is a supported catalyst. Now, in this comparison, all parameters are kept constant except the amount of catalyst. What we have tried to do was achieve equal conversion levels so that we can have a comparison of the product distribution. So, uh, conversion levels for both catalysts in this case, which is the 380 degrees uh, centigrade experiment, is approximately 90%. Uh, As you can easily see from the um, magnitude of the bars, the two catalysts have give very different product distributions. Maybe the, the first few things to note is that the nitride catalyst really gives um, the unsaturated hydrocarbons, here you see benzene and toluene much higher than what we obtain over the sulfide catalyst. If you look at the completely saturated the hydrocarbons, cyclohexane, methyl cyclohexane, ethyl cyclohexane, in all three cases the sulfide catalyst is higher. Also one other observation is that <clears throat> although we are getting more of the unsaturated hydrocarbons over the nitride 
catalyst, we also see more cracking, more dealkylation, because as you can see, toluene and benzene are significantly higher than ethyl benzene over the nitride catalyst. But the basic point here is that the product distribution is indeed looking very different. One point I have to note here that this comparison is done in sulfur-free media. So there is no sulfur compound present in the um, reaction media. Now let us have a second comparison of the sulfide and the nitride catalyst. This is at 320 degrees centigrade, but this time we have hydrogen sulfide present in the feed. And again, we're co comparing the selectivities or product distributions at equal conversion levels. In this case, the conversion is about 60%. As you can easily see from the pie graphs, pie charts, the product distribution has become very similar between the two catalysts. Again, the largest product is orthoethyl aniline, and among the hydrocarbons, the largest product is with 23% ethyl cyclohexane, uh, meaning, uh, first of all, we are not dehydrogenating the catalyst very well, but among the cat uh, hydrocarbons that we're dehydrogenating, the um, denitrogenating, the one which has been completely saturated is, is a major product. Let's repeat the same comparison, this time at a higher temperature, 380 degrees centigrade. Again, the largest um, product that we obtain is ethyl cyclohexane or both catalysts, and as, as you can see, the product distributions are very, very similar. So now what has happened? The nitride catalyst, once we have as some sulfur compounds present in the system, is beginning to behave very similar to a uh, sulfided molybdenum catalyst. We wanted to see what kind of changes took place over the um, surface of these catalysts by doing some post-reaction characterization. <coughs> What I'm showing here in this first view graph is the nitrogen 1S um, XPS spectra for different catalysts. Again, the spectra have been taken without exposing these catalysts um, to atmosphere using a controlled atmosphere stage of the XPS system that we have. We're starting out with freshly activated catalysts and then moving down um, with catalysts which have gone through different reactions. The first one is HDN reaction only, and then we have other reactions which have either uh, simultaneous HDN, HDS, presence of H2S in the feed, or this is um, benzothiophene HDS, but there is also ammonia present. The most striking feature here is the nitrogen 1S signal is diminishing. Even when we don't have sulfur compounds present, it is still weaker, although not as um, apparent as it is here, but especially when we have the sulfur compounds present, the, nitri the nitrogen signal has really <coughs> um, diminished significantly. <coughs> now we are looking at molybdenum 3D region of the XPS spectra and, and the deconvolution results. Well, we see the three um, molybdenum 3D uh, peaks that correspond, that are about 228.8, 230.4, and then a very small one around 232. These correspond to molybdenum nitride, MOO2, and in really very small amount, possibly a molybdenum plus six, um, species. Now, this is the catalyst which has been just activated. This is the catalyst which has gone through hydrodenitrogenation reaction without sulfur compounds. Now, in addition to the 3D convolution peaks that we obtain, now there's another peak appearing here at around 227.8 EV. And from the literature, we have found some uh, studies which report that molybdenum carbide 
has a signal around this um, binding energy level. Now, if we look at the post-reaction characterization of the catalyst, which has which have been exposed to reaction media containing uh, sulfur compounds, we have three uh, examples here: simultaneous HDS, HDN, um, HDN in the presence of H2S. <coughs> Thank you. and HDS in the presence of ammonia. Again, the um, tracing lines are a little maybe weak to see, but in, in every case we see the original three peaks that correspond to the molybdenum signal that we have seen. Now there is also here the um, signal which corresponds to the molybdenum carbide, but now if you look at the sulfur to S region, we also see another feature appearing which we suspect is corresponding to molybdenum sulfide. Now we have also looked at carbon 1S and sulfur to P spectra separately and verified the existence of a molybdenum carbide and a molybdenum sulfide phase um, through these spectra. Now, basing these, uh, using these um, additional information, we have made some rough estimates. I'm saying a rough estimate because, as you notice, the binding energies uh, for molybdenum 3D, 5.5, for the sulfide and the nitride phases is the same. So we have done the approximation using the amount of sulfur calculation from the sulfur 2P region. Based on that, here's what we see. Even when we don't have any sulfur compounds, there's some uh, reduction of the nitride signal as we have seen earlier, but especially when we have the sulfur compounds, the amount of molybdenum nitride on the surface, the percentage, is really decreasing. And Interestingly, we are obtaining some carbide uh, phase, but maybe more importantly, we are also obtaining a sulfide phase. So we are suspecting that the reason we are obtaining a behavior of the nitride, very similar to the sulfide catalyst, when we have sulfur compounds present in the feed system, is because the part of the surface is being converted to a sulfide phase. Now, when we do X-ray diffraction studies on these post-reaction experiments, what we see is that the bulk is still remaining as a nitride. So the bulk is not really changing, but most likely it is beginning to act as a support for the sulfide phase and possibly for the carbide phase. Now, if we summarize what we have observed in this study, we saw that ethylbenzene was the only product from benzothiophene hydrodesulfurization reaction over the molybdenum nitride catalyst. <coughs> Indole HDN, on the other hand, showed C6 to C8 alkyl benzenes as well as uh, alkyl cyclohexanes uh, in the absence of sulfur compounds. When we introduce sulfur compounds to the reaction medium, the product distribution changes very significantly, favoring saturated products, mostly cyclohexanes, more than the aromatics, and the product distribution begins to approach the one that is observed over a sulfided molybdenum catalyst supported on alumina. Now, through post-reaction characterization studies, especially XPS studies, we have seen that there is a significant <coughs> decrease in the nitrogen content when these catalysts are exposed to reaction media, especially in the presence of sulfur compound. And we also saw uh, the formation of a molybdenum sulfide phase and possibly a molybdenum carbide phase over the molybdenum nitride surface. So from these findings, we are suggesting that the bulk of the post-reaction catalyst is still remaining in the nitride structure. The bulk is not really changing. However, possibly it is acting as a support for the sulfide phase. In turn, the sulfide phase is controlling most of the catalytic behavior. With this, I'd like to 
uh, finish my talk by acknowledging the financial support provided by the National Science Foundation. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> For some questions, uh, have you done any TEM work on, on the sample? If you if you you, you suspect a, a layer of the surface is converted to molybdenum sulfide, it should be relatively easy to see on, on TEM because the that very characteristic uh, the space of like 0.6 or 0.6. I think it's 6 Yeah. Not yet, but that's that's uh, one phase of the study we are intending to do because. Uh, you went through the properties fast, but it seemed as your molybdenum nitride is much lower surface area than others have prepared. Uh, five versus, let's say, 100. Oh, the five was uh, the total amount in the reactor. Oh, that wasn't. No, no, that wasn't the specific okay. surface area. The total amount that was in the reactor. The specific surface area for this sample that I talked about was around 95 square meters per gram. We have synthesized some samples with specific surface areas as high as 150 square meters per gram. Um, but both the passivation and the activation steps really change the surface area very drastically. So it's, one has to be very careful in reporting a specific surface area value. Well, if there are more questions, let's take a break, our coffee break, and let's uh, get back here by 3.30 this afternoon.